So, Carry Bear, huh? A relatively short quest that single-handedly managed to reshape my understanding of the structure of Divat, the socio-political state of the continent free cataclysm the true objective behind the Abyss Order, and even the war between the Primordial One and the Second Throne of the Heavens. It was a lot. Which is why today we'll be going over the different aspects of this quest and breaking down the lore and theorizing during the process. And by theorizing, I mean I have a full-blown theory about the Sinner and his implications. This goes without saying, but this is going to be a long video, so I've split it into chapters and provide the timestamps for each one in the description, should you want to skip chapters ahead or revisit others. Though, do keep in mind that they are not 100% standalone chapters and do fit into each other. So, without further ado, let us talk about the structure of Tivat. We were told that Kandria had been an underground nation long ago, however, its location was always a mystery. But according to Kaya, it is located somewhere beneath Sumeru. Now, I don't know if I believe that books about the Fallon nation still exist just laying around like he claims, but considering Kaya Albrecht's ancestry and the fact that Dainsleaf didn't challenge him on it, regardless of the true origin of this particular piece of information, I believe it. What's more, I think we might actually know exactly where Kanria is. Above Erminsol. We know that Erminsol is located deep in an underground cavern and that it grows downwards rather than upwards. And during the Sumeru Arcan quest, when we got to physically reach it, if you were to look up, though that was technically out of bounds, you would see some very familiar red boxes. This might remind you of the trailer for the Abyss Sibling, where they stumble upon a very similar scene, as well as the opening cutscene, where the sustainer uses his same boxes to fight the twins. Even Clothar tries to reassure his son once he regains consciousness and awareness by telling him that the red skies are no more. Put all of this together and we can have a pretty good idea about what the Cataclysm looked like. And while these red boxes are no longer anywhere to be seen in the above ground Tivat, considering where the ground zero of the Cataclysm was, if they were to still be present somewhere, that would definitely be Kanria. And if Erminsol is beneath it, you would just have to look up to see them. So think about it like a big sandwich. Sumer on top, Kanria in the middle and Erminsol at the bottom. However, despite how interesting knowing the location of Kanria may be, I'd argue this wasn't the most important information this quest gave us about the structure of this world. No, that would have come from none other than the Traveler themselves. While reminiscing about their twin and the travels they shared, the Traveler says they would often stargaze and point out which planets they wanted to visit next. This might not sound like that big of a deal, but it really is because Genshin has been confirmed to take place within the same universe slash multiverse as Honkai Impact, which in turn doesn't work like our universe. In the Honkai verse, there is also a very important tree, the imaginary tree. It grows leaves that are actually bubble universes. I'd also thought that Teyvat would be one of these bubble universes, whether attached to the tree or fallen to the sea of Quanta. I will not bombard you with Honkai lore, especially because this is a theory I have already explored in a previous video, but also not really necessary for the point I'm trying to make. Suffice it to say that I'd always picture the twins' travel as being more akin to a dimensional jump, if you will. And that's also because of the nature of the sky of Tevat. We know it is fake, the stars aren't real, so it seems unlikely that the world of Tevat would be part of a larger planetary system that actually orbits a star. But it has to be. If the twins were crossing the night sky shooting stars and going from one planet to the next without jumping universes or dimensions, then Tevat has to be part of a planetary system. And this piece of information reframes the creation myth of Tevat as told by the stone tablet before sun and moon. In it, Faint is said to have been born from a cosmic egg, which it broke, and used the shell to separate the universe from the microcosm of the world. So in conclusion, Teyvat is part of a larger planetary system, with other planets floating around, but it is contained within some sort of dome made out of eggshell. Inside that dome is a fake sky. But the twins travel through the real sky and somehow manage to enter the dome, so whatever the true purpose of this shell is, it can still be crossed. The twins did it, the descenders that came after Fanes did it, and so did a seed from another world that Albedo somehow got his hands on. Though it's also possible they found their way in through the abyss, but none of the information we have so far allows us to conclude this is possible. That's a lot, but if the writer saw it fit to drop so much information on us about the structure and nature of this world now, then I'm really looking forward to what they have in store for us. But for the time being, let us turn our attention back to Kandria and its people. 
Clothar finally sheds some light on a question that had been plaguing me forever. Namely, why are characters like Dane affected by the curse differently from everyone else that got turned into a monster? The answer is surprisingly simple. Pure-blooded Candrians were deemed the bigger sinners and therefore doomed to suffer forever by becoming immortal, while refugees contained within Candria and everyone who had Candrian blood but wasn't pure-blooded were turned into monsters. Now, the term pure-blooded being used here as opposed to full-blooded could be kinda icky, but I feel like it was used rather purposefully. We have already been told that the Candrians were proud, which Clothar only confirmed with his entire self. To bow to the seven or humble themselves in the face of divinity was shameful, which, to be fair, is very understandable post-cataclysm. Canria was a godless nation and they weren't looking to change that. However, that pride wasn't enough for them to turn their backs on the people of the seven who, for some reason, wanted to seek sanctuary with its underground dwelling civilization. And this opens the door to the discussion of two very interesting topics. For one, what kind of civilization was this? Were the people of the Seven treated equally and fairly, or did their treatment mirror what was happening above ground, with the people of Sumer City thinking themselves above the desert dwellers? And two, why were there refugees in the first place? Caribert was Clothar's illegitimate son, which he frames as a thing of great shame. Whether this was simply because he was born out of wedlock, or because his mother wasn't Canrian, though, is never made clear. Part of me wonders if these people received a different curse as a sort of mercy from Celestia, because, despite having abandoned the Seven, they ended up being mistreated by those who took them in. One way or another, they still decided to leave their nation and join Candria, perhaps because they thought it safer. Nowadays, there are people from one of the Seven Nations that immigrate to another, like Tomer, for instance. There are no rules against that, at least not now that Inazuma is no longer under lockdown, so it's not a big deal. But to leave the nation of your patron god to join another one that stands proudly away from the Seven, well, that's another matter entirely, which is why there must have been a good reason for them to do so. There is also the fact that five out of the original Seven Archons have died. Of this, only Makoto has been confirmed to have died during the Cataclysm proper, while we know for a fact that Rika Devata died at the same time but not as a direct consequence of this event. But what about the OG Hydro, Pyro and Cryo Archons? As far as we know, the Cataclysm was the first instance of all-out war in the continent of Zivat after the Archon War. So this is all speculation, but there is a fair chance they also met their doom in Canria. But would Canrian technology have been enough to put an end to the gods who were powerful enough to claim a celestial seed for themselves? Makoto's death can actually be explained quite easily. She was no fighter. She only ever got to rule because of the protection A provided her with and her twin wasn't with her during her final moments. But still, what about everyone else? The current Pyro Archon is the god of war, and it seems that an Archon's successor inherits their predecessor's ideal, so the original Archon would also have been a god of war. Would they really have fallen so easily? All of this leads me to wonder if Celestia used the Cataclysm as a means to kill two birds with one stone. If people were fleeing their nation and turning away from Celestia, then there's a chance their Archons weren't measuring up to their standards. Meanwhile, there was also a nation that had forgotten their status as mortals, thus mankind's irrigation had to be corrected. So for Celestia, this might have been a golden opportunity to get rid of both Canria and the Archons they deemed disposable. We know the Sustainer actively participated in the war, so who is to say friendly fire wasn't on? If I had to bet on who would be capable of taking out four Archons in one fell swoop, my money would be on heavenly principles. But with the background set, let us fast forward to a time where Canria had already been run to the ground and survivors were left to pick up the pieces. Let us tackle the heart of this quest now, shall we? Everything we saw, from the moment the Traveler woke up to see Clothar approaching, to the moment when they truly wake up to see Dainsliff and Paimon standing over them, was a memory from the Abyss Twin that had taken place centuries before. The reason we were able to experience it firsthand? An anomaly in the ley lines, because of course it was. New challenge for Genshin writers just dropped. Make things go wonky without using the forbidden L word. Difficulty? Impossible. In all seriousness, though, it does make total sense. What the Traveler experienced wasn't exactly what the Abyss Twin had lived through all those centuries ago. Right at the beginning, the Traveler questions Clothar or Ada about Paimon's whereabouts, and they get a totally coherent reply. In fact, all of his answers are coherent, well, given his state of mind. And either the twins really do share one single brain cell, or that means that the memory is being molded to and by the Traveler. 
This is further evidenced by the last cutscene we get before waking up, in which the trouble sees their siblings' reflection staring back at them in the mirror. But again, no rules are being broken here. Ley lines had previously been established to be able to do this. Back in Raiden's story quest, the damage inflicted to the ley lines did cause soldiers and a servant who had lived and died 500 years prior to spawn. But rather than just replaying their memories, the ley lines did a backup of sorts of their consciousness, essence, or spirit, whatever you want to call it. As a result, they were able to interact with their environment and talk with A and the Traveler. That's what happened in here. But with a twist. You know the part where the Traveler and Clother enter what is unmistakably in Kanomiya, but we will get there later, and encounter the strange crystal and the sinner? I do believe this mystery entity's speech was entirely a replay of what had happened centuries before, as in, he wasn't talking to the Traveler, but to their sibling. And my reason for believing this is quite simple, the Traveler went out of their way to let us know that the voice was coming from inside their head, not spoken aloud. With that in mind, the sinner asks them why they are bowing, which they absolutely aren't. It's easy to dismiss this as a sinner talking to Clother, who was, indeed, very much bowing. But there is a problem. Once they leave, the Traveler and Clother get into an argument over the nature of this entity. Clother refuses to accept the notion that he could be a sinner, calling him a god instead, even though the voice itself had very clearly called himself a sinner. When you are that in awe of an entity, usually the first thing you do isn't questioning what it says. And this leads me to believe that whatever the voice whispered in Clother's mind was vastly different from what the Traveler heard. That and the Traveler themselves were under the impression that their mentally unstable companion could not hear the voice, which is something they clearly pointed out. So, assuming this speech was a memory in the conventional sense, one question remains. Why do this? Why have only this part of the memory be unreactive towards the Traveler? Well, there might actually be more than one reason. For one, this moment was likely pivotal for the beginning of the journey of our twin as the Abyss Prince slash Princess, likely even more so than anything else that happened to Carrie Bear, if the recently defiled Statue of the Seven is any indication, but again, we will get there later. This might have been the writer's way of letting us have a peek into the way our twin perceived the sinner. If he really was talking to the twin, then they would have been bowing, clearly recognizing and respecting this power in a way the Traveler did not. But also, the ley lines might not be able to record the sinner in the same way they are able to record everything else, because he might also be a descender. We know there is one entity that is capable of altering the information stored in Erminsol, from which follows that they are also able to manipulate the ley lines. This is the entity Nahida warned us about while discussing our sibling. She explained that this creature was purposefully hiding the records of the Abyss Twins' journey, which seems to indicate they have some sort of connection. Moreover, it's possible they are the reason why the twin is even able to be recorded in the first place, as we know that they did, in fact, come from a different world alongside the Traveler. And here we have the Sinner, who clearly has ties to the Abyss Twin, was able to clear the minds of both Clothor and Carrie Bear, manipulated space and perhaps time in order to create a portal to Inkanomiya in Sumeru, and more than likely altered the way the whole thing was recorded by the Leylands. He is ticking one too many boxes for me to dismiss all of this as a coincidence. He must be this entity. But still, who is he really? After witnessing his power firsthand, Clothar was convinced the sinner was a god. And he might have been right, as our mystery entity may be no other than the second who came. As a quick recap, the second who came was a celestial throne much like the primordial one. However, they arrived much later, after Fanes had already created the Vat as we know it and humanity. For unknown reasons, the second throne waged war against the primordial one in its shades. According to the people of Inkanomiya, it was believed that the Primordial One had won because it laid down a ban preventing these ocean dwellers from returning to the surface after the war was over. This seems entirely out of character, which has led many, myself included, to believe that maybe the Primordial One didn't actually win the war and that Celestia is currently under the rule of the Second Throne. But what if Fanes did win? What if it had a very good reason to ban its own people and forsake them utterly? What if Inkanomiya was being used as a prison for the defeated deity? We all saw the impact the sinner can have on humans and healers alike. Locking down Inkanomiya might have been a way to prevent it from escaping and to ensure that no one he potentially came into contact with was free to try and unseal him. The people of Inkanomiya might have become unintentional jailers without even knowing it. 
Before we look at further evidence that seems to suggest that the second who came and the sinner are in fact the same being, we actually have to take a step back and analyze the possible reason behind the celestial war. The artifact said Paradise Lost tells the story of how the goddess of flowers was cast out of heaven during the same war and came to reside in the desert where she created an oasis and a jinn. She would eventually meet and become friends with King Deshret and Greater Lord Rukadavata, with whom she shared a throne for a while. It was with these two friends that she shared her memories of the past. Namely, she recalls a time of peace, during which she and the other Sili communicated freely with the humans. However, that era was brought to an end by the arrival of the invaders descended from beyond the firmament. Read The Second Who Came and Possibly Company. These creatures brought with them destruction and plagues, but also, and I quote, illusions that could break the shackles of the land. These illusions are framed by the primordial one as delusions, which scared it so much it sent down the divine nails to try and mend the land, but with disastrous consequences. Illusions and delusions. Sounds familiar, right? To be delusional is to believe something even when strong proof of the contrary is provided, but in the context of Genshin, this word has another meaning, the devices of a we make. This provides regular humans with abilities that most mortals will never possess, inclusively abilities that are not only elemental in nature and therefore unobtainable through the use of a vision. In a way, they allow one to break the rules. A breakthrough for humanity, if you will. But if we go back to the definition of delusion, a prime example of one in Tevat would be to claim that the sky is fake. That certainly would seem like a delusional statement to most people. How can it be fake when there are stars twinkling in the firmament, when there is a moon and the sun that take turns in the sky? And yet we know it to be true. Scaramouche first revealed that to us during the event and reconciled stars, and more recently, Dottore has confirmed the veracity of the statement by using it as a bargaining ship with Nahida. The infamous truth of this world likely revolves around the fake stars and sky. Like I mentioned earlier, this fake sky was likely formed by the Primordial One's egg, very much on purpose. We have also been told again and again by the loading screen that Tevat has its own rules, which hints to it having unique nature. So what is delusional to someone who lived in this world and only knows this fabricated version of reality constructed by the Primordial One would be simply the truth and reality to anyone that comes from outside of this world. So maybe the second who came didn't bring with them lies and delusions, but truth and knowledge. It's possible they were only delusions from Fane's POV as it seems really interested in keeping the true nature of its world under wraps. And the artifact set Paradise Law seems to back this up, because it also tells us about how ambitious King Dashrat was and about his strong convictions which led him to reject the celestial gift, like Leonosis. He went on to tell his beloved goddess of flowers about his desires, which we can surmise to have been about disobeying Celestia in some way. Namely, he might have wished to spread the truth, or the way Fanes likely saw it, to spread delusions, as the description of the Wilted Fist says. Through King Dashred's words and aspirations, she saw the possibility to transcend the absurd shackles that govern this world. Transcend the absurd shackles of this world. Kinda sounds like what the Second Throne was ascribed to have done upon arriving in Tevaj, does it not? And we also need to consider that Dashrat went on to free forbidden knowledge across the land. Knowledge that has been described to spread like a plague, rob the land of its vigor, and even introduce Elazar. Again, this sounds exactly like what the invaders were described to have caused. Except this all took place centuries after the Celestial War ended, meaning this could no longer have been the Second Throne's doing. And in fact, even the first time around it might have had nothing to do with the Second Who Came. At least not directly. They, or he, might have brought forbidden knowledge with him, but the consequences? Those might have been entirely Fancy's fault. There is another line from the same artifact set that reads Heed my warnings, seek not the master of the four shades, and inquire not of the mysteries of the sky and the abyss. The goddess of flowers, one who knew Fanes, warns Deshret against seeking him out. Specifically, she advises him not to ask information about the sky and the abyss. While there are still many mysteries swirling around the abyss, like I said, we do know that the sky is fake. So was she actually asking him not to question the true nature of this world? To not question the lies Fanes had decreed to be the truth? And this is the creator of Tevat we are talking about. It likely set a few rules during the process of creation itself. Let's say that you jump up. You know that he will fall back to the ground because that's how gravity works. 
It's an intrinsic rule of our universe that is set in place and always works. It's automated, in a way. If Fames was so wary of the truth that comes from beyond the star staging its world, then all it had to do was set a rule in place that ensured whenever this knowledge was detected, an opposing reaction would be triggered, like plague and destruction. So when another throne descended to spread the truth, this rule was activated and things went south with the timing making it seem like it was the newcomers doing. It's also possible it was Fanes actively provoking all of it, but the nails were supposedly meant to help, which makes it seem like it was trying to put out the fire it created by fanning the flames. Guess even all powerful deities can mess up from time to time. While we can't be sure the second throne had good intentions, it seems plausible that he also didn't mean to cause any destruction. He might not even have been the one who started the war. And the way the sinner speaks, it seems very satirical and bitter. He calls himself a sinner, but the way he says it, he says, Oh dear creature, why do you bow down? For I am no god, I am but a sinner. Everything, from the voice acting, to the pause before the I am but a sinner, to the fact that the word sinner itself was written in quotations, just makes it sound like a lie. It sounds resentful, and maybe it is within his right to be resentful. If he is indeed the second who came, then he is a celestial throne just like the primordial one, a god in his own right. Yet he was relegated into the shoes of a sinner by the judgment of one who should have been his equal. He is a sinner, but only in the primordial one's eyes. And for that sin, he must remain sealed for millennia, maybe even forever. If you are still not convinced that the second throne and the sinner are one and the same, allow me to point out two more details. When the disembodied voice from the crystal talks with his twin, it calls them a flower born in sin, yet pure, spotless. Those two adjectives are likely the furthest thing from your mind when thinking about sin and sinners. Yet we need to remember that the twins are the senders, despite one of them not being recorded as such. They are beings that come from beyond the sea of stars, much like the second throne. And just like he has come to accept that he will always be viewed as a sinner by Fanes, due to being an outsider and carrying the truth that comes with that fact, he also knows that the primordial one would extend distance towards the twins. They were born in sin because they were born outside of the Vat. Everything that is not contained within Fanes' eggshell might be a sin to it. Which sounds terribly hypocritical when we remember that it too is a descender, yet it is somehow cleansed of all sin. But I digress. The sinner recognizing the Abyss Twins' origin and, in a way, recognizing both of them as sinful creatures does lend a little bit more credence to all this speculation. And at last, the elephant in the room, Istaroth. Genshin writers can't make lore without ley lines, and I can't make lore videos without Istaroth. Seems fair. Anyways, I mentioned that Inkanomiya might have been sealed off for the single purpose of jailing the second who came, thus why the celestial gods completely cut off contact. Well, with one sole exception, because Istaroth was still around. Why would the primordial one be this careful only to allow this one god to waltz in and out as she pleases? Both Thanescliff and the second throne himself might have given us the answer to that particular question. At the end of the quest, Dane mentions that the sinner has likely seen the traveler as time is of no significance to him, while the sinner told the Abyss Twin during the memory that, at the end of time, he would look back at their fate and shed a tear. Which, as a little side note, is an eerie parallel with the Abyss Twin telling the traveler that they have always had enough time back during the We Will Be Reunited quest. Regardless, the point I'm trying to make is that the sinner likely has some form of mastery over time. The Primordial One probably possesses ability at some point, as they belong to the same race of beings, however it split itself into four shining shades, one of which was Istaroth, God of Time. So it's possible this ability was relegated to her entirely. Depending on how this time-related power works, it might make sealing the Second Throne that much harder, and Istaroth's intervention might be required to make it possible at all. We know she stuck around for a while, in both in Kanomiya and Mondstadt, at least. But post-cataclysm, we know the sinner might have still been bound to the underwater nation, but was already capable of reaching out, as it made a portal to Sumeru, so it doesn't appear he was completely sealed. Istaroth was gone by then, as far as we know at least, so it's possible her disappearance was a prerequisite for the sinner to even be able to start making his moves. 
Now that all the evidence has been laid down, let us assume for the rest of the video that the sinner is, in fact, the second celestial throne, a being who brought with him outside knowledge which unintentionally set off a cascade of destruction and got him into his current predicament, a being who made the birth of the loom of fate possible. At the start of the memory, Carrie Bear is in bad shape. He is completely unresponsive, not unlike the hilly trolls we saw in the chasm that were approaching the end of their life. However, when the tendrils of darkness shot out of the crystal and into Clothar, they also infused a concoction we had prepared for Carrie Bear with the power of the sinner. And this made it so effective that the symptoms of the senescence the little hilly troll was going through not only were fully reverted, but he also gained back awareness. And not your typical hilly trollian awareness, either. These monsters are not completely without thought, they have their own customs and a language that is coherent enough that humans can pick up on it and use it to communicate with them to some extent, but their intellect cannot be compared to that of a human. And yet here we have Carrie Bear, back to his pre-cataclysm self with all the brain power and curiosity you would expect of a young child. Through the power of the sinner, he regained his sense of identity, which is arguably the one thing that healy trolls are not meant to have. During Requiem of Echoing Depths, it was revealed that the reason why hilly trolls wear masks is because, though the memories of their past life fade away in time, they are still able to recall, to some extent, what it was like to be human, to resemble a human. So to see their own monster's reflection causes them great anguish. But Carrie Bear remembered everything. He was able to recall the red skies, the room in which he hid, and his father and mother. He was a hilly troll with full awareness of being human. The only thing standing in the way of him truly knowing himself as he was in that moment was that he had yet to accept his current condition. But he did do it in the end. By taking off his mask, he refuses a fate that was forced on him. He will no longer be a mindless beast. He will no longer play by the rules of the primordial one. Being the limb of fate means he is capable of reweaving his own fate and possibly that of other creatures, which in Tevar of all places is a very big deal. Fate is a very predominant theme in the lore due to its association with the stars, which in turn play a very big role. But this quest also put a new spin on it. While talking to the Abyss Twin slash Traveler, the sinner claims to know their fate very well and later makes that comment about shedding a tear while looking back on it. This frames fate as being not only foretold, but also unchangeable, something you cannot escape. And maybe you can't if you are playing by the rules of this world. But knowledge is power, and if you are willing to obtain it, if you are willing to be branded a sinner for it, then it might just allow you to shit at this game. When the sinner asked whether the beast twin sought power, that might have been what he was referring to, knowledge. After all, that's what he granted to this father and son who had been forsaken by the gods. Because it wasn't only Carrie Bear that remembered or learned something through this. Clothar's mind became immediately clearer, and after his son became the Loom of Fate, he seemed to have figured out a great many things about Carrie Bear, about the rules of Tivat, and even about the Abyss Twin. But could knowing really grant one so much power, you wonder? Well, the Goddess of Flowers surely seems to believe so. I have a couple more quotes from the Paradise Lost set to share with you. Know this, if there is to be hope in this world, it will be found kindling within mortals most ordinary. Carrie Bear was just a normal kid. Even if there was something special about pure-blooded Kandrians, he wasn't one of them. He was utterly ordinary, and yet he became something extraordinary. The Goddess of Flowers placed a great deal of importance on normal humans, and the set's descriptions mentioned this multiple times. Here, listen to this. The Red Lord shows a noble lie, shepherding his followers on a path towards oblivion. You seek but to chain the winds. Upon the tombstone of divinity shall humanity become the god of gods. Such a carefree dream was certain to be unmade. In ruins where lies are sundered, humanity will become the king of kings. What hides here is more than lies, but also the future of humanity, burning like the sparks of hope. Through this, we learned that King Dashrat's rebellion against Celestia was due to a noble lie. But when you consider the adjective the mother of the jinn chose to use here, the last line of this quote, and what we previously discussed about the primordial one and what it considers to be delusions, it seems rather plausible that this lie might actually have been the truth that Fanes didn't want getting out. So what the Goddess of Flowers seems to be telling us here is that, should the truth be revealed, Celestia would fall and humanity would rise up. 
in ruins where lies are sundered, humanity will become the king of kings, the god of gods. Meaning, dwelling within the most ordinary of humans lies a great deal of power that is kept dormant by the rules of this world and the lies of its creator. Perhaps anyone could become a womb of fate, and maybe more people than we realize have come close to it in the past. Let's talk a little bit about allogenes, shall we? With Celestia not being particularly trigger-shy when it comes to nuking entire civilizations, it's obvious it isn't above considering humans as possible threats, which is why the concept of visions has always been so weird. They are supposedly awarded to beings, both human and not, who display a great deal of ambition. The thing about ambitious people, though, is that they can achieve remarkable feats despite all odds. So why take someone like that, who isn't necessarily allied with Celestia, and provide them with the means to become even more dangerous? It makes no sense. Unless Celestia is trying to force them to play according to their rules. Instead of waiting around until these people figure out the amount of dormant power they possess, Celestia awards them a vision that still makes them more powerful than regular humans, but keeps them within limits and forces them to obey their pre-established rules. Visions also seem to have a sort of kill switch that takes away much of the motivation and even many of the memories its past wielders possessed. If the requirements to activate its hypothetical power is knowledge, and Carrie Bear's trigger were his memories, by taking them away if the allergens get too rowdy, Celestia can neutralize his threats without getting directly involved. This is all highly speculative, but the point still stands. Celestia might want to keep up their lies because they are afraid of human potential. They are afraid of human arrogation. But what exactly did Carrie Bear do after becoming the Loom of Fate? He was engulfed by Abyss of Power, the same power the Sinner wields, and then everything faded to black. Presumably the impact of this abyssal energy was enough to knock the Traveler out. When they came back to, the Hillish Earl was nowhere to be found. Instead, Clother was going on and on about how wonderful it was that he could now reweave his fate. What exactly that means, we can only speculate about for now. However, we do know that Clothar went on to form the Abyss Order and roughly 100 years later went missing. That said, if the Traveler's intuition is correct, he has now been found. Well, his remains have been found, that is, as he is believed to have been interred in a weird field by the hut alongside his son's mother. She had been buried much earlier, which, yeah, that almost surely means that she served as fertilizer for the mushrooms Clothar fed Carrie Bear. There should have been nothing but bones by that point, but come on, this is Genshin, they have to throw big yikes into it. But back to the point at hand, Clothar shouldn't have been able to die due to his curse. He believed that the power of the Abyss held the solution to all of his problems, hence his fate in the Sinner, Carrie Bear, and even the Abyss Twin, which he recognized as being able to wield the same power. Maybe Clothar found a way to use it himself in the end, or maybe his son lifted his curse. Maybe Carrie Bear lifted his own curse, became human again, and led a normal, happy life before dying of old age. Nah, the quest is literally named after him, we will see him again at some point. The real question is, what role will he play? Will he be an ally or a foe? And what stance will his descendants take? And more specifically, what will Kaya do? Kaya Albrecht, a descendant of Clother Albrecht, founder of the Abyss Order. This much has been confirmed. However, our favorite smooth talker of a knight isn't necessarily directly descended from Clothar himself. We know that the Albury clan was a very prestigious one, having even become regents of Canria after King Erminstrand failed them. This high status is important, so don't forget about it. Anyway, they could have been a pretty big family, and as far as we know, Kaya may be able to trace his roots back to Clothar, his siblings, or maybe even Carrie Bear himself. Clothar is inspired by Clothar I, king of the Franks, well, presumably, who had three brothers, Theodoric, Clodomer, and Childbirth, and a sister, Clotals. I probably butchered those names. Anyway, Clothar I had several children, including rumored illegitimate ones, though the real-life counterpart of Carrie Bear was actually not born out of wedlock. So there's a lot of possibilities for Kaya's genealogical tree. However, Carrie Bear, assuming he was able to revert his curse, might actually be the most likely option, or, at the very least, Kaya likely had a non-Canrian or partially Canrian relative somewhere in his lineage. 
and that's because of his eyes. Dainslet and Clothar have been confirmed to be pure-blooded Canarians, Pierre, having held a high station back in the Fallen Nation and not being, you know, physically a monster, is probably also 100% Canarian. And if you look at the eyes of all three of these characters, you will notice that, for one, they are all blue, and two, their pupils are primogem shaped with a very sharp and very dark outline. Kaya's eyes, however, are much softer. Well, his one visible eye, at least. It's still blue, and his pupil is still primogem shaped, but it lacks the starkness that these three other characters possess. Add that to the fact that he identified Dane as being pure-blooded Kandrian just by looking at his eyes, and it's safe to assume that the eyes of mixed individuals are different. And this actually explains something. The underground nation was described to be very powerful, so its population was probably rather numerous as well, even without counting the people of the Seven who live there. And we know that some of these kept on having children despite the curse, otherwise Gaia wouldn't exist. But with Kandria being no more, it would make sense for them to have said children with people from the Seven Nations, which means a whole lot of mixed kids running around. But where are they? Well, pupil shapes in Tevat are as varied as eye and hair color, but there are actually some characters whose pupils are almost primogem shaped, but not quite. Like Kuching's. Now, I'm not claiming that Kuching is Kandrian, all I'm saying is that a lot of the characters we have met so far could be part Kandrian without even knowing it. Just something to think about. More importantly, though, the existence of these mixed individuals does seem to indicate that the curse isn't hereditary. Obviously, only those of pure Kanrian blood were able to have children on account of not being monsters. But where exactly does the curse end? Say that two Kanrians had children, their offspring would also be pure blooded. Would they still be afflicted by the curse? Did these children have to be mixed in order to be able to age normally? What if they were afflicted by the curse? Would they just remain a one-day-old child forever? That sounds like quite the eternal nightmare for the parents. Did this curse only affect those it was directly cast on and not future generations? Or perhaps Carrie Bear was the one who managed to free the future generations so that no other child would have to experience what he did? I guess we will just have to wait and see, just like we will have to wait and meet our twin again. We have been calling them the Abyss Prince slash Princess this entire time, but we might as well have been calling them Kandrius Prince slash Princess, because apparently this high status predates the creation of the Abyss Order itself. Which makes sense. For an entire defeated nation to just spontaneously decide to follow an alien that popped up after the fact would be pretty weird. According to Glothar, Kandria was already looking for a new source of hope and power even before the Cataclysm, which they found in the Traveler's Twin as they were able to wield Abyss of Power. As a side note, during the final cutscene, we see that they were already synced with their original light element back then. I wonder whether they managed to get it back in the centuries between both events, or if the sustainer was unable to take it away in the first place. Regardless, to me, this interest in abyssal power means that the would-be abyss order already knew a lot about the abyss and its potential. On account of this, our twin rose in station so high that Clothar, belonging to the Regent family, wasn't even surprised that they didn't know him. He basically said, of course you wouldn't know a lowly being like me. But again, if the writers did take inspiration from Clother I, Clother Aldrich might have been in line for the throne. That's not the kind of person you overlook, which makes me think this might have been another instance of the memory molding itself to the Traveler's consciousness and that the real Abyss Twin might have known him, meaning the original convo wouldn't have gone like that. Still, this really sets the scene for how important the twin was, because Clother didn't even question it. Except, there is a problem here. If they were the prince slash princess, Dane would have been well aware of that fact. But while discussing their position within the Abyss Order, he simply mentions that they can't be the top dog, because they are referred to as the prince or princess, and not king or queen, so there must be someone who ranks above them. He makes absolutely no comments about their role in Kandria. He could just be keeping his cards close to his chest, but this is Dainsleaf we are talking about. The only character that is actually willing to drop lore at, well, the drop of a hat. It feels weird, but as of right now, I don't know what to make of it. I do have an idea of what to make of the Abyss Sibling's plan, though. By the time we tried to go back for the crystal, it was completely gone, despite the portal to Inkanomiya still being there. Clothar, for all his mental instability, went on to form the Abyss Order, which our sibling joined, so they must have seen the genius in Clothar's madness. 
He believed the sinner and the abyssal power he wielded was the key to their salvation, so the twin must have believed the same. Case in point, a certain statue of the seven was recently defiled to mimic the crystal where the sinner was presumably contained. And the resemblance of the feeling they both generated must have been truly uncanny, because the statue was the first thing that Rodler thought of upon seeing the crystal. So what does all of this mean? The Abyss Twin stands with Conria against Celestia, so they want to take down Faints and release the truth of this world. The same truth they insisted on the Traveler learning for themselves back during the We Will Be Reunited quest. Back then they also spoke of their war with Destiny, with Fate, the one Faints controls. And who would be a better opponent for the Primordial One than a being that is its equal? Another Celestial Throne, the Sinner. We don't know where he is currently, though Dane believes him to be watching. The Abyss Order might also not know his whereabouts, and the Defiled Statue might have been an attempt to release him or summon him so that he might fight alongside them. But what do you think? Is this a true goal of the Abyss Order? Who do you think the Sinner is? What role do you expect Carrie Bear to play going forward? My brain is still absolute mush because of this quest, and there are still so many angles that I did not explore. In fact, there is a lot I didn't cover both because this video was getting way too long or because I didn't find it relevant enough, at least not according to my current grasp of the lore. Anyway, this is how highly speculative, so again, and like always, take it with a grain of salt. But if you think I missed something, please do share it with all of us in the comments down below. Anyway, this is all from me today, uh, because this took way too long and there's still a lot of lore to tackle, so <laughs> my name is Blue and I'll see you again soon. Safe journey, travelers!